Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third in our 2021 series Oceanscape Marine Tech webinars. My name is Emily Collicott and I work here at Oceanscape for Plymouth City Council and I will be your host for this event. Just a quick reminder that during this webinar, you will only hear myself and James speak. We will not be able to see or hear any delegates. After the presentation, we'll be holding a Q&A session. Please use the Q&A bar to ask any questions throughout the presentation and we will answer them at the end. If you see any questions you would be interested in hearing the answer to, give it a like and that will send it to the top of the pile. Just a reminder, this webinar is being recorded with the intention of making it available to others on demand. Enjoy, and I will now hand you over to Dr. James Fishwick from the Plymouth Marine Laboratory and Smart Sound Plymouth. Good morning. Thank you, Emily, and good morning, everybody. And thank you for taking the time to, to join us this morning. I trust that you'll find it informative and useful. Um, so just in a way of brief introduction, firstly about myself, and then secondly, a little bit more about Plymouth Marine Laboratory. So uh, as Emily said, James Fishwick, I work for Plymouth Marine Laboratory. I've been there for 21 years. I uh, started there as a bio-optical oceanographer um, with a keen interest in the Western Channel Observatory, which is um, an observing stations off the coast of Plymouth, which I'll cover a little bit more around in my presentation. Uh, more recently, I head up top, um, technology and operations on the Western Channel Observatory, and I also head up um, driving impact um, from technology across the organisation. Um, in addition to my roles at PML, I also head up Smart Sound Plymouth. I, um, I chair the Future Autonomous at Sea Technologies Cluster, and I also chair the Maritime UK Southwest Autonomy Special Interest Group. Um, so just today, I'm going to talk mostly about PML and our, our aspirations around um, smart observing systems and autonomy. Um, but just in way of introduction to PML. PML is a, an independent research organisation with charitable status. We have around 200 employees and we cover quite a diverse um, science set. Um, so we sort of specialise from um, benthic work through the pelagic ecosystems and into the atmospheric, atmosphere and atmospheric interactions. Um, as well as our sort of in-field specialists, we also have um, world leading expertise in remote sensing and um, ecosystem modelling. So today I uh, obviously wanted to talk about more around our smart observing capabilities and also our autonomy interests. So I'll, I'll move forward now. So um, PML head up Smart Sound Plymouth. Um, smart Sound Plymouth is a, a trials, validation and demonstration um, area offshore of Plymouth um, for the testing and development of advanced autonomy and marine technologies. Um, smart Sound is a collaboration. It is between the Plymouth, uh, Plymouth City Council the Marine Biological Association, the Universities of Plymouth and Exeter, and as I say, led by PML. And it forms part of the Marine Business Technology Centre. So um, marine, the Marine Business Technology Centre facilitates um, free support on free use of smart sound. Um, I do apologise to all those who've seen this slide before, um, but there is some on the call, I believe, that have maybe not heard about smart sound. So I'm just going to give a brief sort of overview of what the um, smart sound is all about. So um, you'll see the blue area marked on the chart in the left hand part of my screen. Um, that is the area that we tentatively call smart sound. It was an area that we put a lot of effort into in the early days around um, deconflicting authorizations and making sure that other stakeholders and other water users were, were happy. And also that we covered um, a diverse set of environments that we could offer out for innovation and support of um, development into autonomy and advanced marine technologies. Um, importantly, we do have access to deep water, um, deep water in the sense that the water is deep enough to facilitate subsurface um, platforms and we have um, hosted several trials in, in subsurface autonomy and linkages with subsurface and surface autonomy. Um, the, the smart sound is heavily instrumented um, largely through the Western Channel Observatory and the assets of the observatory, um, which I'll come on to a little bit more detail in future slides. And, and through that, those multiple assets are available to um, organisations to come and utilise for, for trials and demonstration purposes. Um, surrounding the offer is also um, access to a professional team of people across the, the, the breadth of those organisations I listed. And, and importantly, um, there's industry engagement through the, the FAST cluster, the Future Autonomous at Sea Technologies cluster. So there's also access to industry and collaborating industry partners across Smart Sound as well through the cluster. Um, Smart Sound is accessible, uh, not only in the sense that it is um, free at point of use through the Marine Business Technology Centre to eligible organisations. Um, it's also accessible in the sense that it's, it's not far offshore. Um, the extents of Smart Sound is around 20 miles offshore. 
Um, so it, you know we can get to assets quickly. We can recover things. We can we can deploy. It's um, some some things you know if you put on the boy at sea, you might not see it for eighteen months at a time. So it, the equipment that's deployed on the smart sound is also accessible, um, and we'd like to think it's accessible as well in the sense that um, developers, innovators can come to us. They might have a, a concept idea. They may have a, only a sensor that needs to be integrated into a platform and no experience of how they might deploy that piece of equipment at sea. So we put a whole wraparound service around that. We can walk through that whole journey with them right from point of concept right through to sort of commercialization and uh, and development of those sensors. So um, I just want to move on now um, to highlight some of the um, investment that's gone on into Smart Sound over the last sort of 12 to 18 months. So it's starting with um, two large data boys, uh, the ERDF funded Marine Business Technology Centre facilitated um, the replacement of our main boy system, which sits at a station six miles south of Plymouth. Um, that investment was around £400,000 and I'll talk about that one in much more detail in a couple of slides time. Um, the second platform is, an, is one that we operate um, at the extent of Smart Sound, which is 20 miles offshore. Um, that platform Form is in collaboration with the UK Met Office and, and they have invested in a new boy for that platform for that station as well, which will be deployed later this year. Um, the, the new boy for L4 will have an autonomous profiling capability, so a bit of a game changer. Um, the previous boys only really um, sampling the surface waters. The new platform will have an autonomous um, sensor platform that can deploy right through the water column. Um, the new platform has got large power availability and also plug and play trials platform for third party development, which is obviously key to the offer of smart sound. But I'll come into much more detail around that boy in a couple of slides time. Um, we've also recently had some significant investment from um, UCRI, the Natural in Environmental Research Council. That was a half a million pound investment um, for a new five metre autonaut. Uh, it's high speed connectivity to that autonaut. It's a very sophisticated sensor suite that will be deployed on that vessel, including pH, PCO2 sensors and active fluorescence. And again, I, I have a, a couple of slides on that vessel later on in the presentation. Um, you're probably aware that through the MBTC project, the University of Plymouth have procured a Seaworker 4 from L3 Harris. This was again another £350,000 investment. Uh, this this vessel has, there are previous webinars around this vessel that were given by the University of Plymouth and um, they are still available on the Oceanscape webinar website. So I would strongly encourage you to, to, to have a look at that if you're interested in using this vessel. But this vessel um, is available for, to organisations to utilise under the Marine Business Technology Centre project. It has dry and wet sensor payload bays. It has an underwater retractable mast and quite key on this vessel is a robotic operating system. So it um, interface into the robotic operating system, I should add. So not only are we able to test sensors and, and technologies on this vessel, but we can also um, look into um, development of new autonomous algorithms and a way a vessel could be controlled and operated within an autonomous environment. So um, it has an ability to plug in additional robotic operating systems. And then uh, more recently, we've had another a further investment from NERC. Another £200,000 has been added and that has enabled us to procure four um, science autonomous eco subs. Um, they have sophisticated sensor payloads and they are, um, they are fully integrated networked um, platforms. So again, I have a, another slide on that in a, in a few slides time. So I'll, I'll come on to that in a bit more detail. Um, I just wanted to touch, I mentioned the Western Channel Observatory. I just wanted to touch on some of the key attributes of the, the Western Channel Observatory and, and how it adds really quite a unique feature into Smart Sound and, and what's going on offshore of Plymouth. So we say obviously um, Smart in Smart Sound has different aspects, um, not only the, the smart technologies that are being deployed, but also the smart in the sense of our understanding of that environment. So the Western Channel Observatory has been um, in existence for over 100 years. Um, the data sets do extend back over a century, but it's not only the longevity that's key and unique here, it's also the, the diversity and the breadth of the measurements that are taken and the platforms that we have. So you can see on the, the charts on the, the left hand side of the screen, um, there's the key station here is L4, that's our coastal station. Um, that has had a, a data boy permanently deployed, well, um, seasonally deployed there um, for over 10 years now. Um, but also we visit that station on a weekly basis with our research vessel, taking a whole suite of measurements right across the, the sort of spectrum through the pelagic water column right into the atmosphere. And we also have additional benthic surveys as well, where we sample the seabed. 
Um, our offshore station, you can just see there's a, a little red dot with a, an E1 next to it at the bottom of that chart. Um, that is on the extent of Smart Sound, and it's about 20 miles south of Plymouth. Uh, and that one, we've operated a buoy there for the same length of time, just over 10 years. And um, with more recently, the collaboration with the UK Met Office, so they now own the buoy platform at the E1 station, but we collaborate. So they, they obviously deploy the meteorological station um, sensors, and we do the in-water um, sensors on there. We also visit that station every two weeks with our research vessel and take a whole array of measurements there as well. Um, you'll see the yellow dots on the chart. They are our benthic survey sites. So they are sites that are regularly sampled for the benthic um, work. Um, importantly, then the, the land based, the terrestrial nodes, you see Rainhead. Then um, we have meteorological stations at Rainhead, um, but also we deal with Rainhead as our largely used as a communication node across the smart sound. And then Penley Point. Penley Point has an atmospheric observatory. You can see the picture on the, the far right of my screen there. Um, a very sophisticated atmospheric observatory there. Um, so not only is the Western Channel Observatory got a very um, key and, 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 and very significant in, in water observing platforms, it's also um, complemented by um, world leading remote sensing and also um, ecosystem modelling. So that's a little bit about the, the Western Channel Observatory. Um, I just wanted to include this one in, a, in addition to a, a lot of the investment that I talked about on the earlier slides. There's been a recent um, investment of £200,000 via NERC to replace our um, state of the art sampling rosette. So, the bottom left hand corner, you'll see um, that's a picture of the existing rosette platform. It's our, our sort of main um, sampling platform from the vessel, it's utilised to collect water samples throughout the water column. But key to that as well, there's a whole suite of electronic sensors on that platform that connect live to the vessel. So as we deploy that platform through the water column, we get live data feeds of what's going on throughout the water column so that we can take our water bottles at their most appropriate depths. Um, so we've had a, a £200,000 investment there. We've ups, upgraded that reset system, um, working with Planet Ocean Limited to provide us with a, a seabird electronic system. Uh, it will have much more sophisticated sensor payload on the new system. And importantly, that, that rosette is, in, is available. We can, we can add additional sensors to that to profile through the water column for trials and validation purposes. And clearly the, the, the water bottles collecting discrete water samples can then help to validate the measurements being made. Being made. Um, also on the research vessel, just to point out, we have an underway um, sampling system. Um, the, the vessel has a dedicated hull intake, which um, feeds water through the sensor suite as the vessel's um, underway. Um, there's a, quite a com complex suite of sensors on there, not only measuring in water parameters, but also the meteorological parameters as well and light levels. Um, but again, there is capability within that sensor suite to add on additional sensors into that flow through system so that we can trial and validate new technologies. And, and the vessel and all the infrastructure is, is available to SMEs and, and other organisations um, through Smart Sound Plymouth and through the Marine Business Technology Centre. So I'd just like to move on now to one of the main sort of um, things I wanted to talk about today, which was the new L4 boy. Um, I obviously mentioned that was a £390,000 investment through the Marine Business Technology Centre funded by the ERDF. Um, the buoy is a, a real game changer to PML. It will be deployed at our coastal station L4 and importantly it, um, it has an autonomous capability. So this really is a unique feature in the UK in coastal marine um, observing platforms. It has, um, it's very sophisticated, it's not a fixed platform. We can add and remove different sensors to that payload. Um, it's very user um, friendly in the sense that we can define the speed, the depth, the time. We can hold positions through the water column um, we, and we can completely configure that schedule so that the, the boy will look to a schedule on an hourly basis and that schedule can be changed and altered via um, PML and then it's hosted on our servers which the boy will communicate with to update the, the latest uh, capability that, and then it will determine from that whether to profile. In, interestingly as well, um, the boy will always maintain surface samples, so we will maintain an hourly sampling strategy as, as we have done for the previous 10, 10 years plus with our existing platforms. Um, and we hope to gain pro, full water column profiles three or four times a day. Um, that's very dependent upon um, the weather, the conditions at the time, and the buoy will monitor the, the movement of the board platform, so the accelerations of the platform, and also as part of the, 
communicating with the servers. It will also be looking at the latest meteorological information to make a decision autonomously whether or not it's safe to profile those sensors through the water column. If it's not deemed safe to profile, the sensors will just deploy to um, just below the surface and then they'll take the, the, the standard hourly set of measurements. Um, the buoy is a huge platform. I think you can see in the, the, the sort of the two central pictures, the top one is um, is the floats that are sit around the buoy platform, um, scaling against our forklift truck there. The diameter of the buoy is just short of four metres, so it's obviously a very significant platform in size. The central picture is actually a picture taken internally inside the buoy superstructure, so within the tower. So you can see there's, there's plenty of um, space in there. There's an awful lot of capability. We've been able to plug in new sensors, add sensors, and, and, and work with third parties to trial and demonstrate those sensor payloads. Um, key to being able to do that, we have a large power availability. The boy has quite extensive um, solar and wind charging. There's currently 800 amp hours of solar charge on the boy um, and complemented by um, three um, wind turbines, two charging into the 48 volt system for the winch and, and one powering into the 12 volt system where um, the 12 volt system has around 600 amp hours of battery backup and the uh, 48 volt system has um, 400 watts, uh, 400 amp hours sorry, of battery backup. Um, it's a very sophisticated fully network control system. I'll come on to that on my next slide. Um, it will be integrated into a high speed communication system, so um, high speed comms to the boy. Um, also, interestingly, in the subsurface sensors, um, anybody who puts things in the water will know. It comes no surprise that one of the big issues is biofouling and um, biological growth on those sensors, which obviously then can um, detriment the, 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 the uh, measurements being taken. So this boy has a, a quite an advanced anti-fouling system. It's an electrolysis system. So the, the cage will sit in a, a, a garage, as they call it, in, within the tube system. Um, and then for 10 minutes every 24 hours, um, we'll apply through electrolysis into the seawater to generate a very, very, very small amount of chlorine, which just within that contained um, area then prevents the, bio, the bacterial growth on sensors, which then ultimately would lead to further biological growth. So um, the, the other manufacturers, I mean, um, other boy operators of this particular platform um, in the Mediterranean have a lot of success with that anti fouling system. So we're quite um, hopeful that that will uh, solve a lot of problems around biofouling for us and then increase the amount of time that we need to go and, um, and maintain this platform. Uh, I should point out at this point the platform was provided by Hydrosphere UK and the manufacturer is a French organisation called Mobilis. Fully recommend them, a fantastic organisation, very helpful and as you'll see they've delivered a state-of-the-art game-changing platform to, to PML, the Smart Sound and the Marine Business Technology Centre. So as part of the, the procurement of the platform, we do have a, a, a sort of a core sensor payload um, which maintains the ongoing aspirations of the Western Channel Observatory but also adds um, support information and, and um, contextual information to any trials um, that we will be undertaking not only on the platform but on smart sound as well. Um, so some of those parameters that we'll be measuring as part of the core platform are depth, um, seawater temperature, the salinity, we measure sound velocity, density, um, chlorophyll A which is the photosynthetic pigment in phytoplankton so it gives us an understanding of the level of um, algal activity in the seawater. Um, we also measured coloured dissolved organic material, um, the light levels throughout the water column, so that's the photosynthetically active radiation, so it's the, the part of the spectrum that's of interest to photosynthesis. Um, we'll also be measuring the nutrient levels through nitrate, um, key also um, pH sensors will be added to, this, to the network, and also turbidity, so the, clar the, the sort of clarity of the water. Um, above water, we'll be measuring the hyperspectral irradiance, so that will be through the UV and visible ranges of the spectrum, um, downwell in light from the sun. Um, wave height and direction and period and then in collaboration with the Met Office, the Met Office will be putting on their, their full meteorological stations which will obviously include air temperature, humidity, atmospheric pressure, wind speed and direction. So they'll, they'll be the core sensor payloads that will go onto that platform but clearly you'll see there's, there's plenty of capacity on that boy to be able to develop and test third party innovation and, and new sensors. So it's a real key interest for PML. Um, we're, we're keen on developing new autonomous platforms, 
but also the payloads that will go onto those platforms. So what will make the autonomous platforms useful to us, and particularly from PML's aspirations in the science and environmental monitoring world. Oh, so excuse me. So I, um, I talked a little bit about the third party integration. Um, the team at PML have developed a very sophisticated um, mechanism to, to facilitate that that's based on sort of 10 years worth of experience that we've had on our previous platforms working with SMEs and other organizations to trial and develop new sensors. Um, key to this is the ability to um, power cycles. So um, in previous iterations, the only way of um, turning the power on and off was to actually physically go to the platform and do that. Um, through this new system, we, we do have the ability to um, power cycle remotely so we can turn your, your platform on and off and give it a full power reboot. Um, also, there's there's um, several channels. I think there's eight initially, but there's capability of adding more um, so that your your sensor will have a, its own channel, its own power supply, and that channel will be integrated through a ruggedized PC system. Um, it also has an onboard um, network switch, so we can actually facilitate um, network networking to sensors as well. And uh, I think the concept behind all this is that it gives people the ability to see, modify, and reboot. So you'll be able to log on to this system, you'll be able to log into your particular um, your sensor, you'll be able to see how it's performing, make modifications to it, work on it as if it's plugged into your laptop on the bench next to you, and then of course reboot as necessary. We will also be able to provide through the, the high speed communication system um, access to data and, and um, diagnostic information as well. Um, so a very um, sophisticated third party integration system. Um, just a, a couple of images here around the existing systems on the platform. Um, these are the, the, you can see the winch in the bottom left hand corner there that goes up through a roller on the um, mounted on the roof of the platform, then down through the central moon pool. Um, you'll see um, a central picture is the actual sensor payload. Um, this was provided um, through Planet Ocean Limited um, and through Seabird Scientific. So it's a very sophisticated payload. I just need to point out that the sensors that point out the sides are not going to remain there. They're just temporarily housed there at the moment until whilst we're doing, in the process of getting everything up and running. Um, they're obviously quite exposed there. Um, so, so that's that's more information about the boy. Um, I really would encourage people to get in touch. We do have three or four um, manufacturers now who will be trialing new sensors on the boy when it goes to sea. And um, we're in the process of integrating those sensors into the platform in addition to the core sensors that we're already integrating. Um, I mentioned as well earlier on that PML have won half a million pounds from Merck for a new autonaut. Um, I think it's fair to say that this is only one of, um, of two in the UK of the new designs. There are some earlier prototypes around in other organisations, but the sort of more commercially available modern design of autonaut, there are only two in the country, um, and this is the second one. Um, but importantly, this one will be probably the only one that will be routinely deployed and, and utilised in UK waters and also quite importantly um, available to um, SMEs and organisations for innovation, um, adding sensors onto this. The Autonaut is, is a unique offer to compare to the Seaworker 4 that I mentioned that the University of Plymouth have. Um, that is a, a, an engine propelled vessel. It has far more power availability on the vessel. Um, but it has much more shorter duration at sea. One of the, the complementary features of the Autonaut is that it's a, a longer term deployment vessel. We can pretty much be unlimited, but our aspiration is around three weeks in every month. We want to be at sea with this vessel. Um, the vessel is wave propelled, so it takes its forward momentum through wave uh, motion. And then you'll see that there's um, 300 watts of solar power charging on deck, which power a bank of batteries to supply the electrical payload to um, facilitate communications, command and control, and then all the sensors. Um, I think also it's fair to say that this, this vessel is probably the most sophisticated scientific payload vessel ever being delivered by Autonaut, and certainly uh, very loaded with sensor technology. Uh, just quickly uh, give you an overview of what we're, what we're um, delivering with this vessel. So um, on the mast, we'll have a Gill Met station, um, a trios hyperspectral irradiance sensor, so uh, measuring the downwelling light from, uh, from the sun. Uh, we'll have high definition, um, high, def high definition cameras, um, communication systems and navigation systems on the masts. Um, going subsurface um, are mounted on the hull. We'll have a Seabird electronic Seabird 49 CTD. Um, we've gone with two new um, clear water sensors, a new company. Um, 
commercializing technology that was developed through the National Oceanographic Center. And we will be procuring two, um, two sensors for, for nutrients, one measuring nitrate and the other phosphate. And they'll be mounted here in this um, a fin that mounts on the hull subsurface. At the bottom of that fin, we've gone for a seabird sensor and um, the sunburst sensor, sorry, ISAMI pH sensor. On the back of the fin, we have two Anadera sensors, one measuring dissolved oxygen, the other measuring carbon dioxide. Um, we have in the hull here, but the, it will penetrate the hull so that the, the actual sensor um, lenses will stick out into the water, which is a wet labs puck, which will measure chlorophyll and um, colour dissolved organic material and turbidity. And then um, the final sensor we've gone for is a um, Chelsea Technologies lab staff. Um, this works in a similar way to a chlorophyll fluorometer. It's measuring chlorophyll levels using fluorescence, but far more sophisticated than just looking at um, chlorophyll concentration. This sensor actually uses the photosynthetic system to calculate um, photosynthetic efficiencies and rates of photosynthesis. So it's a really great measure of not only the quantity of, of plankton in the water column, um, but also the, the, the health of that plankton, how well it's photosynthesizing and, and how well it, it is in a health sense. And obviously that has implications for all kinds of things in sort of um, water, water clarity and um, and uh, water quality, sorry. Um, the, the, the next set of investments I wanted to talk about was a fleet of um, EcoSub Robotics. We procured four um, EcoSubs. We have three of the larger platforms and, and one of the, the nano ones, the smaller ones. Um, these are key to, to this. Is, uh, this is a fleet of four, clearly. It, um, it is one of the most comprehensive payloads I think that EcoSub have ever delivered and importantly it has the new generation of Veilport sensors on here so sensors specifically developed for this kind of platform for small autonomous subsurface platforms. Um, it's the largest fleet in the UK that has the capability of working in an integrated network so through the nano modems these these um, subs all communicate with each other and work across an integrated network and also I I, I understand it's the, the first and only fleet that also integrate into a surface vessel of the autonaut so these vessels will also integrate into the autonaut in a communications sense as well and you'll see from the slide that the payload that we've gone for this particular um, platforms is the most sophisticated that the ecosub offer um, it includes turbidity um, temperature conductivity, so obviously we can calculate salinity, um, dissolved oxygen, an altimeter, and um, chlorophyll fluorescence. Also, on one of our ecosubs, we will be um, having a, a GoPro mounted on the front, so um, we can obviously take um, seabed and, and sort of mapping exercises. And the altimeter is quite key on that because the altimeter allows the vessel to track the seabed rather than a fixed depth. Um, so we're, we're, I mean, we're really pleased to have these these platforms and look forward to receiving them in the next couple of months and then starting to deploy them across Smart Sound. And so it was a bit about the assets and the, the investment that we've had on the Smart Sound. Um, I have the privilege of sitting here and talking to you all about it, but I'm also very thankful for the team of technologists at PML who are delivering this technology to the Western Channel Observatory and to Smart Sound Plymouth. The team is Oban Jones, Yanni Pewter and Adam Wright. Um, importantly, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that there is an opportunity to join that team. Um, we will be putting a job advert out very shortly for a, an additional marine technologist post um, focusing on robotics and electronic engineering. So if you have any interest in that area, you're keen to join the team at PML, um, either get in touch with me or keep your eye out for, for that post um, as it comes out in the next couple of weeks. Um, I just wanted that there are future webinars around Smart Sound Connect and Smart Sound Digital, but I just wanted to just touch on them today because they are very relevant to the platforms that we've already talked about. Um, Smart Sound Connect will provide that connectivity, that ability to integrate across a network. Um, so Smart Sound Connect is a project that's been underway for around six months. Um, Vodafone and Nokia have been contracted to deliver the 5G and the 4G um, private marine network, which will largely encompass the port of Plymouth. Um, in the central image, you can just see the coverage that's been um, planned. Um, the 5G boxes are key areas. These are um, pre-agreed autonomy trials areas. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't deploy other autonomous access, assets across the port, but these are already pre-agreed with the Harbour Master to facilitate autonomy trials. And we do have to obviously go through full um, port authorization to do that, but um, but they are pre-agreed areas and will be covered via the 5G private network. Um, 
the control hub for that network will sit at Ocean's Gate and they'll be able to facilitate um, third parties being able to access office and um, workshop space at Ocean's Gate to um, utilize that 5G um, private network. Um, also, we'll be shortly going out for a tender process to provide the offshore connectivity. So not only are we providing high speed connectivity across the port, the whole of Smart Sound will be covered by um, a high speed connectivity. At the moment, that won't be 5G, 4G, although we do have aspirations to deliver that technology across the whole of Smart Sound. But in the initial um, phase, we expect a high speed marine broadband capability across that net um, across the Smart Sound. And importantly, we're aiming to have an integrated network across those two. So seamless integration between the offshore capability, bringing inshore onto the 5G, 4G connectivity. Um, and importantly, that network's free to use. Um, it, we, we, the investment was £1.8 million through the Local Enterprise Partnership. And through that investment, we will be facilitating all kinds of use cases. Um, unlike the Marine Business Technology Centre, that, that use case is, is diverse. We can work with anybody anywhere um, to deliver that. So if you've got a use case for those particular network um, assets, please feel free to get in touch. But also, I would draw your attention to the the um, continuing Oceans Gate webinar series, because there is a webinar later this month on this particular aspect. Um, bringing all that together, bringing the Smart Sound Plymouth, all the, the sort of assets and the, the, the capability, bringing in the communications through Smart Sound Connect and delivering now what we're calling Smart Sound Digital. And um, this is the aspiration to deliver a digital twin, a simulation of the natural environment um, across the Smart Sound. This will bring in live data feeds from networks and sensors that are already in place, aspirations to build on those networks, particularly in the port environment, building a sophisticated network across the port. Then there's a large consortium formed. I was going to start naming names, but then it's a very large consortium and never to be able to leave people out. So um, I'm not going to necessarily name names, but there's a large consortium. They're very significant players across the UK in this world, in the digitization field. Um, the particular digital twin can have multiple use cases. Um, smart Sound is focusing mainly on smart ports, um, smart cities and marine autonomy. Clearly, I'm sure everybody on the call is aware that Plymouth has recently been um, awarded free port status and that will play very heavily into the autonomy, innovation and smart ports technology developments. Um, and also we're keen to investigate around sort of advanced port controls and situational awareness for how you deal with autonomy and manned systems operating within the same port, ongoing logistics, et cetera, et cetera. So a really interesting project. Probably later on in the, all the Oceans Gate webinar series, we may hopefully do a, a more specific one around the digital twin as that project moves forward. Um, I just wanted to touch on something that PML is working on. So there's a project, a NERC funded project called Campus. It's a three year project. Um, and this is really about delivering smart autonomy. So it's about taking real time data feeds from autonomous platforms and other sampling platforms. So remote sensing, we take data feeds from the remote sensing, um, the platforms deployed in the water, and then we run them through sophisticated um, ecosystem models. This is a, 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 a graphic of our um, model, one of the models we run at PML called um, ERSEM. It's a very sophisticated model, um, ecosystem model. The idea of this is that the model would be trained on data. It will then allow to go forward in a predictive mode. So therefore it would identify interesting features, interesting areas where we would want to direct the autonomous assets. So it will give us the ability to future predict where our assets need to be to maximize on those assets to give us the best understanding of the scientific um, and environmental monitoring that we can do. Um, so we have long term modeling um, predictions through ERSEM. Part of this also will be around probabilistic modeling that brings in a much more real time modeling. So that it allows enhanced feature tracking. So as a, a bloom, for example, might form in the marine environment, we'll be able to understand the likelihood of that happening ahead of time, divert our, our most appropriate assets to that area. And then through the probabilistic modeling, those assets will be able to much more accurately um, track that feature as it develops. Um, interestingly, on that project, we've got to the point now where we're doing a three month field tram, um, demonstration. Um, so in on the 16th of March, so next Tuesday, we'll be deploying a Slocum glider in the, the box that you can see marked on in, in red. And um, that's just to the west of the E1 station. Um, that glider will operate in that box for the next three months. And as we go through that three month deployment, we hope to ramp up 
and move closer and closer towards the aspiration of smart autonomy. Hopeful at the end of the three month deployment, the models will actually autonomously be directing those assets. So um, the pilot, the, the assets are very heavily piloted at the moment. They, they involve um, humans uh, interfacing with those, telling them where to go, setting up um, missions for them. We hope to move to, through this deployment to a scenario where the models will predict the features and then guide those, um, those assets autonomously. Um, so that's what we hope to get to with that project. And then just really bringing this sort of session to a, a close, um, I wanted to briefly talk around our aspirations of an integrated observing network. So with all these facilities, all these assets that are, are coming into Smart Sound Plymouth, through Plymouth Marine Laboratory and the, the Western Channel Observatory, we're really keen to demonstrate the concept of a net zero connected observing platform. These platforms are pretty much all powered through um, solar and wind um, powered systems. So they offer really a, a very net zero approach to um, autonomous observing of the marine environment. And a real showcase, I think, in the UK of the capabilities that can be delivered in this field. Um, linking to the campus and the, the previous slide, we hope to deliver smart autonomy across this um, observing network. Future aspirations around seabed docking systems for our subsurface, best, um, subsurface platforms, housing those platforms on the seabed, given the ability to have surface communications and power charging, and then we'll be able to de deploy those systems on various missions from the seabed docking stations where they'll then return, download data and, and charge themselves up ready for the next missions. And then also future aspirations around, we've delivered a, 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 a very enhanced, very capable surface communication system. We also have aspirations now around subsurface um, communications and positioning networks. So there's some of the aspirations for Smart Sound going forward. And then I, I briefly mentioned the FAST cluster at the beginning. It's really just the final slide to bring in the um, significant impact really from industry engagement and industry partnerships across Smart Sound. So the Future Autonomous at Sea Technologies cluster very much play a very active role in Smart Sound providing industry steer, um, helping us to determine what our investments will be in, what we need to deliver, what platforms need to be enabled to help to innovate and to deliver future autonomous solutions and sensing solutions into the maritime industry. The FAST cluster is a, a, a key example of a very strong cluster um, formation representing a triple helix structure through industry, academia and government, um, and a real critical mass within the Southwest um, at the FAST cluster also links into Maritime UK Southwest through the Marine Autonomy um, Special Interest Group in the Maritime UK. Um, there is a link there to a video, so I'm, I'm not going to play that now. It's eight minutes long, but it is a, a really good video. It gives a very clear um, indication of the Southwest capabilities, what's there to, um, to enhance, and that's cross sector. So it includes marine autonomy, um, offshore renewables and aquaculture, and importantly, how autonomy can interface across those various sectors as well. Um, through Maritime UK Southwest, the Autonomy Group has recently won a Department for International Trade High Potential Opportunity. Um, we're very close now to finalising that HPO, so that, that comprises of a whole suite of marketing material that really showcases the international investment opportunity into the Southwest around marine autonomy. And then also through the FAST cluster, we are working with MRS and ITN Productions to be filming a new film um, that will hopefully be filmed uh, we've been waiting obviously for the current pandemic to subside significantly enough for us to be able to do the filming in an optimal way to really make the most of that opportunity. So we're hopeful within the next few months we'll start filming on that, but that will really produce a, a, an international um, film. It's only a short section within a larger film, but it will showcase all that's going on in Plymouth and the Southwest around marine autonomy and include everything that we've talked about, the FAST cluster, Maritime UK Southwest and all the assets and aspirations across the partnerships. And that's it. That's me. Um, that was uh, the uh, hopefully a very useful overview of some of the capabilities that we're bringing in, um, some of the things that are already in place, and really the opportunity that really is is there and, and manifests itself to to third parties to come and join in with that, utilise those assets to help innovate and deliver future um, technologies to the maritime environment. Um, will be a, a session now on questions and answers, but if people want to contact me privately feel free to do so. You can see my email there on the screen. So thank you very much for listening and happy to accept any questions. Thank you, James.
Um, just a reminder, if you have got any attendees, have got any questions, if you use the Q&A um, option, we will go through, read them out as we go through. James, we do have some questions for you. Um, re re docking, are you looking at Konsberg, sorry if I pronounce this wrong, Illum, or developing something different? Um, we are looking at what other options might be available. There's no point in reinventing wheels, I must admit, but then having said that, there are other capabilities within the FAST cluster and the um, ecosystem within Plymouth. Um, I perhaps shouldn't give too much away for commercial sensitivity purposes because clearly that's one of the other strings to smart sound. We offer full commercial sensitivity around product development, but I think um, we are open to what that futuristic aspiration might be. It is an aspiration at this moment in time. We are very well aware and we are in conversations with various fast cluster partners who are developing similar technologies. Um, so I think it's fair to say we're open, but, but that's kind of where we are. It's aspirational at the moment. Thank you, James. Um, what are the timescales and deployment strategies for these assets? OK, yes, so um, the new boy has already arrived. That arrived in sort of October, November last year. Um, it's in the Smart Sound workshop at PML, currently being fitted out and, and, and um, trialled and tested to make sure all the systems are integrated and working properly. The aspiration for that platform is that we will deploy it on station in April this year. Um, so that should be in the water in April and then available. Uh, but is what I'd encourage with that particular platform, that if people do have sensors that they think that would be really useful to have on that boy, may want to trial and develop it for a period of time. Keep get in touch as soon as possible because it's much easier to do that whilst it's in a workshop environment than trying to integrate things at sea. We can and have integrated platforms and sensors at sea, but you know, whilst it's in the workshop, it's an opportune time. So I'd really, um, really stress get in touch as soon as possible regarding the, the boy platform. Um, the Autonaut will be delivered to PML in March, early April of this year. Um, we will go through a sort of a, a commissioning phase and a training phase, and then we hope to really have the Autonaut out and about on the Western Channel Observatory and across Smart Sound. We're aspiring to have it out for three weeks in every every month, so a week of downtime in every month. Um, we will build up gradually towards that. It's fair to say we won't go for a three month a three week deployment on day one, um, but we're hoping that through the summer months uh, of this year that 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 vessel will be very active out across the Smart Sound and collecting real key information for the Western Channel Observatory. And similar with the Ecosubs, um, the Ecosubs are expecting delivery of those to PML at the end of March. Um, we will then, we those won't necessarily go out for long periods of time. They'll be very much um, specific targeted, targeted field campaigns. So um, from PML's point of view, we'll be looking at interesting scientific features as the spring bloom, the, the, the phytoplankton bloom systems come into play. We'd like to deploy them in targeted bloom zones. Um, so they're a bit more um, bespoke and, and aspirational deployments. Uh, and again, if people have a use for any of the platforms we've talked about, how we can help you in any way, please feel free to get in touch and we can we can put a whole wraparound service around all those platforms and facilitate. Um, I don't think we've ever failed to facilitate any missions that we've been asked to do. So I'm, I'm fairly confident we can, you know, as long as they're within the, the the, the capability of the platforms will be able to facilitate anything. So yeah, again, just really strongly urge people to get in touch and start those conversations as soon as possible. Thank you, James. Um, what the final question that I have here is how how to get involved. So I think you've touched on that. If you just wanted to clarify at all. Yeah, no, absolutely. So there's there's various ways to get involved. I mean, if if you just want to try, if you're involved in trial and sensors and innovation. Um, feel free to contact me. Um, I can link you in through Smart Sound across the partnership of the MBTC. And through the MBTC, we'll facilitate and work with you to develop and, and, and innovate whatever technologies and capabilities you wish to do. Um, other ways of getting involved is through the FAST cluster. Um, the FAST cluster is a very open cluster, it's a collaborative cluster. Um, and again, just get in touch with me um, and we can start that conversation. There is a I wouldn't necessarily say formal, but there is a process involved in becoming a member of that cluster. It's not onerous, it's more just around um, gaining um, the support of the rest of the cluster. But um, that's always been positive. We've never had any negative. It's a very collaborative cluster. So there's two aspects. If it's smart sound, if it's around innovation support that you need, come to smart sound, let us know, we can help you. If you want to get involved in the ecosystem within Plymouth, then the FAST cluster and the industry partners and that collaboration is, is open and, and we'd be keen to hear from you. Thank you, James. Um, 
that looks like all of the questions for today. As James has mentioned, he's more than happy to take questions offline if you do have anything further to pick up with him. Um, you also have my contact details. Um, so if you'd like me to pass any questions on, or inquiries on to James, I'll be happy to do that on your behalf. Uh, finally, many thanks, James, for presenting today and to you for attending. That's it for today. We will be posting details on future webinars on our Oceansgate website. Um, James, are you happy for me to close the live event? Yes, no, thank you just again for me. Thank you to all for, for taking part today and listening in. And hopefully it's been of some use and really keen to hear from you all as to how we can get involved and how we can work together going forward. So thank you again. Thank you and goodbye, everyone. Bye.